we just um, are we just generating so, too much code there's just so much code being generated that at this point it's a numbers game you're just gonna memory corruption issues are just gonna be in every bit of code base going forward and it's not something we can actually fix on the developer side I do think it is something that can be fixed. I don't think it will be 100% eradicated. It's sort of in that hard versus harder um, respect. And there are some things that I think are exciting and new ideas, especially around maybe not getting rid of memory corruption vulnerabilities and making them not exist in code, but making them unexploitable. Because if a vulnerability exists, but no That's one can actually win. exploit it. That's not even a useful, vulnerability. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, it's not really like the whole point is we don't want people to be able to hack others, have capabilities, see data they don't. So it's not so much, is there a vulnerability? It's okay, is this vulnerability able to be right. used to harm someone or organization? Um, so like, I mean, obviously I'm going to, I know my team's efforts more than other ones. So that's what I can talk about. But like, I think it's really exciting the work that Samuel, um, has started to do with the V8 security team, which is the JavaScript engine on Chrome of trying to create um, a heap sandbox. So I think when I was talking to him, like most of the V8 security bugs um, in the wild security box would be, be seen, they would be unable to be exploited um, if the de design makes it into Chrome. And then um, Chrome is also working on um, backup ref pointer, miracle pointer, other things that will make exploitation of memory corruption vulnerabilities harder. And so I think those types of large scale mitigations is really one of the areas that um, will help make existing code um, more robust against memory corruption exploitation. I also think a lot of the work that folks are doing of rewriting new components in Rust and memory safe languages, like as new code, if we're focused on that new code coming in, yeah. um, memory say like that's how we keep making progress to the point that, you know, having a useful memory corruption vulnerability is more and more rare. And you got to focus on the logic and the design. Am I going to look at your spreadsheet in five years and see uh, uh, less memory corruption issues there? Or do you, get, are you, are you really confident and you have a sense of optimism that this, this mitigating it and making it hard to actually, listen, Microsoft has been trying for this for years and every time they come out with a new mitigation, it gets bypassed, right? And they even removed it out of scope for their bug bounty program because their memory corruption uh, mitigation just doesn't work. It feels like cat and mouse, cat and mouse, cat and mouse, year after year. 100%. But I think the other thing to keep in mind, and it's one of those questions that I just don't know, is again, in our spreadsheet, we're tracking what is detected right. as an industry. And so I think it might be easier to detect memory corruption vulnerabilities and exploits than it is logic ones, because we know these memory corruption vulnerabilities right. have to follow this pattern. So can you, and we have tools like ASAN builds and things like that, which trigger and tell you, oh, there's memory corruption that's happened here. And so that is a big question in my mind of, are there lots of more logic and design vulnerabilities being used? We just don't know how to find but them, right. all of our tools, and our knowledge, exactly. And so that's where one of the questions I have is because, you know, like one of my teammates, James Forshaw, who does so much Windows research, like, Almost all of the bugs he does is and has for years are logic vulnerabilities, not really memory corruption. Um, and so it would make a lot of sense that, you know, other attackers who are not finding vulnerabilities just to report right. them to and the, the vendor. And the prediction um, is that we'll see a lot more of those mem uh, logic design bugs when Rust kind of takes root, right? Yeah. Yeah, because the logic and design bugs, you know, they're they're harder to find in automated means because you don't know exactly what their pattern's always going to look like. They're exploiting a design choice, a logic choice, and thus that's going to look different for each. I want to swing back to the code. transparency issue here, and it ties back to one of your second recommendation, which is calling for vendors and security researchers to share samples, exploit samples, and, ex and uh, exploit descriptions. That stuff is a. I don't know how to explain this, but for the audience, a lot of. APT zero day activity gets found by a threat intel vendor or an anti-malware company or an EDR company. And then that becomes a marketing tool. That becomes an important kind of, we need to hold this back so we have this kind of, and that's the reason why these things aren't being shared. 
What does that look like in your mind? Is there like a best practices piece there that you can, what does that number two recommendation look like to you? Your own company is somewhat guilty of this. You kind of leave us in the blind saying there's this amazing, amazing maze of zero day activity and multiple amazing things. Your, your door is wide open and good luck. So, right. So what does that look like? So I would not say that that's the commentary first off that, you know, that's my commentary and uh, Android are saying, I think they're giving us the information of, hey, this was not just given by a researcher, but there was some reason we are saying it's in the wild. No, no, no. I'm talking about something like even one of the projects, project zero, like say, let's say the project zero citizen lab thing. There's no exploits for that. You guys told me that there's this freaking most badass exploit you've ever seen. Yet, what- and the rest of us, we just kind of like, okay, we just have to hope that our phone isn't targeted. Yeah. And so I think it's hard. And that's where Project Zero, I think even in our blog post, we admitted we were like, we have not quite figured out, you know, the perfect answers to these questions because there's each case. Is, is it each- because of NDAs? Help, help the audience understand no. what blocks that. So one, it's if we do look at the tracking spreadsheet, we will see that lots of these zero days to all different vendors are reported anonymously. And so what I would take from that is that if someone's reporting it anonymously, then there's a reason behind that. And also that might mean there's more considerations of they, there's reasons why they can't necessarily come out and say like, here's the exploit um, sample, um, you know, or, even whether it would so it's it's probably tied up in some negotiations it can be tied up in negotiations yeah. where you know whoever the source of it it might get reported from a cert somewhere that says no details to be shared here's here's this exploit no details to be shared yeah. like there's a lot of that yeah and even like in the case of if someone shares a sample with you and like i'm really thankful when folks have allowed us to publish the technical details so at least the technical details are out there and we can still work to provide um suggestions for de- defenses and mitigations and things like that um that it's not your choice as the person who it was shared with whether right, the rights to that data still belongs to your source right yeah and you want to but, but so what you're arguing here what you're arguing here is for your source to change his mindset right i mean not necessarily your source but sources in general to change their mindset around allowing the sharing of these so i i don't feel confident saying that either because I don't know, you know, the details behind whatever sources or how zero days may come to be. And that we need to remember when zero day exploits are being used, that this is not just some malware sample you found on virus total, like people's physical safety has been harmed with the use of zero days. These zero days can mean a whole lot to the people who have them. And so I don't think it's fair for me from my, you know, home office sitting here safe and sound to be able to tell someone what will or will not, um, what risks they should be willing to take because I want to be able to see the sample. And, but at the same time, I put that recommendation out there because I do think there is so much from the industry that we can learn from these samples and that trying to- It's a major dark spot. It's a major dark spot. Yeah, and trying to lean further into default behavior is sharing and it's the exception when they can't be shared publicly rather than I think where the industry is right now is the default is not to share and the exception is when we think there is little risk and things can be shared. So that's what I'm hoping to push for. Um, and that in the meantime, like if people are still feeling scared and hesitant and worried about sharing the sample, then maybe they can share the sample with orgs like myself or other research organizations, threat Intel teams who will write up the detailed technical aspects. Because one of the biggest reasons I care about these samples as well is that when you're using a zero day exploit, there's really two parts to it. Yes, there is the vulnerability, but there's also the way that they go about and make that vulnerability useful. So what I call the exploit method or the exploitation technique. And so it's not just about patching that vulnerability. If we can break the exploit method, then we made it harder too. But without exploit samples, there's no way for us to know even what that exploitation method was. So I think being able to, if orgs can at the very least start publishing, you know, more technical details this year. That's the first step, baby step. And hopefully people will see, okay, the world did not come crashing down. Like 
things are okay. Let's start, you know, sharing more right. samples. I think that could be a path um, for us all to move more towards the default of transparency around these samples. It feels very weird to me because I agree with you that there are, there are improvements. Those even those one-liners in the Apple advisories. I'll take it. I'll take a line that says it may have been exploited prior to the, whatever they say. It's an yeah. improvement. But at the same time, I look at Microsoft's documentation over the years, and it seems to be going backwards. It seems to okay. there's a lot of companies are not as upfront and descriptive about vulnerabilities like that than they used to, and that's a dark pattern that's noticeable. Uh, we don't, we're running out of time, but I, I, I can't let you go without asking about the biggest part of your job. It's not only that, it's the root cause analyses that you guys publish, which I really, really enjoy, uh, which is really delving, picking, picking like a really good thing and delving into why you think it happened and making these specific recommendations. You mentioned it earlier in the pod. When you, based on all the root uh, RCAs you've done, are you spotting any sort of significant interesting trend around development, software development that is worth pointing out? from the RCAs that you've done? The thing that I see is the biggest trend from year in review 2020, year in review 2021, and so far into 2022, is not only do these bug patterns and the components being targeted look similar to public security research and previous bugs we've seen, but they're actually often variants or bad fixes of previous right. that's a big big back. big trend is like a, a lot of the fixing isn't complete yeah and as someone in the security industry i understand sort of why like platform and vendor security teams are so under resourced and fixing patches and triaging vulnerabilities is not something like the industry tech industry industry generally rewards in terms of promotion the right? job too yeah. and the so the like, job yeah. And it's a really hard, like, it's a hard job. So I can't come in and say, vendors, this is how you fix this. But I think it's something we really need to take a look at of, okay, so we're seeing this even when the original bug was, say, an in the wild zero day, the fact that a couple months later, that patch wasn't even completely fixed. And now the attackers are back and exploiting it just by this little change to their code. I think that's something we really need to focus on because we're not capitalizing on the fact that we've caught one. We can see what they've done. We can see what they know and fix it so they can't get back in. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is these is just good patching, good mitigation. Um, the basics, we got to do well at the basics first. You guys are giving, you guys are giving the skeptic too much, too much. I, it's just, it feels like there's just so much, um, so much room for pessimism. Uh, with where things are. But I, I think the work that you guys are doing is among the most important work. We haven't talked about one day and we haven't, there's a lot of things to talk about still in this thing. So Mari, come back anytime you feel like there's a, come back next year. Hopefully when we have this conversation in, let's say five years, these numbers are trending in, in a better direction. Yeah, and I mean, I know you're saying this is all giving you reason to be pessimistic, but it's all, it's giving me reason to be optimistic. There's things we can do um, and things that, even the industry has done to take those baby steps. So I'm hopeful. All right, let's leave it right there. Thank you very much, Mari. Thank you.